what it looks like here to grow. So we are going to jump right in, and Ella is going to come present the real reasons to travel. Picture yourself in the heart of one of the most famous churches in the world. You just landed in Madrid one week prior with nine classmates and two teachers, ready to embark into the great unknown of freshman four point. You've been staying with a host family of five in the outskirts of Zaragoza, one of Spain's largest cities. This is how I spent my last two weeks of March for my ninth grade immersion trip. The date was Tuesday, March 27th. At the bright hour of seven in the morning, as the sun rose over the foothills of Spain, I sat in the car with my host mother as we drove into the city. She dropped me off at Zaragoza Central Station, where I convened with my group of classmates and teachers. After exchanging a quick recap of our night apart, we boarded the 745 train to Barcelona. One and a half hours and 314 kilometers later, we were a third of the way across Spain and slowing into Sant Station in Barcelona. We departed the train and got on the metro, which took us to a stop labeled La Sagrada Familia. I've been looking forward to this day ever since I got the itinerary as I had heard of this famous destination and always wanted to visit in person. As we climbed out of the underground metro stop, we were told by Mr. Alford, don't turn around until I tell you to. Upon giving his signal, we all turned to face one of the most breathtaking structures I had ever seen. We had the opportunity to take a tour of the inside of this unfinished church, and the views kept getting better and better. After the 30-minute tour around the church, we convened outside and sat on the side of the street. We were then told again by Mr. Albert to go back inside, because when would we ever see something like this again? I stood in the heart of the church, gazing up at the magnificent ceilings that seemed to defy every law of architecture and physics, when I was suddenly hit with a wave of emotion. I looked back on my trip in Spain and realized how many experiences I have soaked up and how I craved to soak up more. I became suddenly sad, wondering how I was going to be able to do so much in such a short lifetime. I turned to Miss Allen and exclaimed, there is simply too much I want to do in my life. To which she responded, Ella, that is one of the best things you could possibly feel. Upon later looking back at this moment, I realized that was the most hopeful I had ever felt for my future. I was overwhelmed with the excitement to live. I wondered where such an inspiration high came from, which is when I realized it came from new experiences. After fully processing my trip to Spain upon returning home, I was able to finally understand why we travel and why we do it in ninth grade at Gould. Four Point was unlike, any, was unlike any other travel experience to date. I was able to make countless connections with new people that were able to help me better, better understand the world around me. Having the opportunity to stay with host families was a great way to be able to truly absorb the travel experience of Spain. Staying with my host family taught me how much, how many, how much I don't know about so many things, including Spanish. The first night with my host family is when, I, was when it really hit me how different this experience was going to be. I realized I'd understood the true meaning of a language barrier the second I stepped inside their car. They still managed to be as welcoming and comforting as possible by resulting to other methods of connection other than just speech, such as kindness, music, and of course, food. They immediately made me feel as if a member of their own family and were my gracious navigators of Spain, teaching me about the culture and history of their country by taking me to many beautiful sites. They taught me how to be a guest and what it is like to be the least aware person in the room. It was nice to not be the one that everyone turns to for answers, because I was allowed not to have them. My host family was able to inspire me to learn and try new things that I would have never had the courage to do before. Being a very picky eater, food was one of my only causes for anxiety when thinking of my upcoming four-point trip. I had built up in my head that Spanish cuisine was terrifying and exotic based on single stories. And why? because it was a foreign country, because they spoke a different language, who knows. But once arriving in Spain, I felt like a new person. I was able to leave my old self behind and embrace my travel self. Wanting to appear normal around food with my host family, classmates, and teachers drove me to try new things with no fear. Ordering this seafood paella with no prior knowledge to its ingredients was a huge step for me. I had never tried shrimp or mussels before, despite living on the coast my whole life. But with the coaching of Miss Allen and others, I was able to learn how to properly eat shrimp and mussels, and I actually enjoyed it. The taste of seafood brought nostalgia from my childhood on the water, which encouraged me to try more.
Being able to feel the adrenaline rush of new experiences is something that I realize can only be found by getting out of one's comfort zone, whether it be physical or mental. Traveling taught me that you can't get new experiences if you stay in one place, and this urge to travel has inspired me to live for my future. I learned that I still have so much in my life to experience, and it is up to me to get myself there. I found that having this inspiration is important to me, and it should be something that others should strive for as well. So I ask you to look for the inspiration in life and its experiences, and it is this that should be looked for in travel, not the destination, but the inspiration discovered afterwards. And that's how you'll know it was a good trip. Thank you. that they produced. Um, if you had the chance to go to trustees while they were presenting, uh, you saw some of the special special talks, so thank you, Ella, for doing that. And ask the other ninth graders what they talked about. The next up, Katie Kajan. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about what I did for my senior four-point project. So my essential question. How can a community member offer support to their public health system? So what did I do? Public health is a really general term, and so what I wanted to do is not go too deep into one uh, subcategory of public health. So I split my project up into two parts, education and then giving back. So for education, um, in the summer of 2022, I shadowed at Boston Medical Center um, I was able to set up this shadowing through a program that I did at Boston Medical Center the summer before, so summer 2021. Um, so this program was all virtual and it consisted of weekly Zoom calls, probably like three a week, and where we were spoken to by healthcare professionals. And they weren't just doctors and nurses, it was translators to um, support group members and anything like that. So um, that's where I met Dr. Herstack. So she presented to us about addiction medicine, um, and it really resonated with my interest in public health. So I reached out to her, and we scheduled an interview. And so um, through that interview, I was offered shadowing with her. So I was able to set up three shadowing um, things in the OVAC clinic so far and catalyst clinics. So these are all three different addiction medicine clinics, and I'll go into more detail about what those mean. So a little bit about Boston Medical Center. It's not a typical hospital. Um, the reason why I was interested in working with Boston Medical Center is because it's a safety net hospital. This means that they offer um, health care to anyone, regardless if they have health insurance or not. Um, that's why, so they have a really big patient demographic, um, that's why they're equipped with translators, social workers, and really a large healthcare um, team. And so they also have a really robust uh, addiction medicine program. So each of these um, are different programs. Uh, these are the ones that I participated in. So first is the office-based addiction treatment clinic. So this clinic is a primary care-based clinic, and which isn't really a usual addiction treatment um, center. So it's kind of a new way of looking at addiction medicine is through a primary care basis. Um, so I shadowed Dr. Herstack um, and we saw patients from referrals and their current everyday patients um, anywhere between someone who's uncomfortable with their alcohol use to someone who had just relapsed the day before. Um, and so at the Catalyst Clinic I shadowed Dr. Bagley um, she works with adolescents who suffer with substance use disorders. Um, so I saw three patients with her, and um, each were within the, at least two years of me, which was really interesting to see. Um, and then at the SOFAR clinic, they work with anyone who's affected by um, a substance use disorder, whether that be parents or the patients themselves. Um, and so at this shadowing, I was able to sit in a team meeting um, and so I got to see the patient navigators, social workers, nurses, doctors, everyone together and what their roles were. 
So the types of patients I saw. Um, everyone I saw was affected by substance use disorders and psychological trauma. Uh, this was really prevalent in the clinic with adolescents because when you're around um, opioid use from ages two and up, it really affects you. Um, and so a lot of the patients that I saw were dealing with anxiety and depression as well as their um, addiction. And so uh, in the clinics, they are specialists. So they saw regular basic patients, but also referrals, um, which was interesting to see because they had um, a really good connection with the current patients. And then I also got to see what it looks like to be a specialist in addiction medicine. So the two medications that um, are used in addiction medicine are buprenorphine and methadone. And so these words were kind of circulating throughout the clinics and it took me a while to understand the um, uses for each of these because they're very distinct. Um, so buprenorphine is used when a person is on steady recovery and it kind of just aids them um, by blocking the um, receptors in the brain for opioids. Um, so buprenorphine is kind of what the current patients were on, um, leading them to a steady recovery. Methadone, on the other hand, is used right after a relapse. So a lot of times uh, patients go to a methadone clinic, get prescribed methadone for that day, and they go back every morning for about two weeks. Um, and so people can be on methadone for just those two weeks, or they can be prescribed when they have a really severe addiction. And I saw a patient who had relapsed the day before who was on methadone, while I saw another patient who had been on buprenorphine for a couple of years. So other than addiction medicine, I'm also really interested in women's reproductive rights. So um, for my second part of my project, I wanted to focus on something um, that kind of was in that realm. So I've found uh, Moving Health, it's a nonprofit, and I um, worked on their development committee, which basically what we did was um, help, we had monthly Zoom calls and discussed events and um, fundraising. And so we met on Zoom calls like this. Um, sorry, my pictures are really lame because I couldn't really take pictures in the hospital and all I did here was Zoom call. And um, so this is what the anti-gala looks like. This is their main um, event that they host. And so it's basically a big fundraiser for their major donors um, where they can um, get to know the people who make the ambulances and um, just get to see how the organization is doing. So a little bit about Moving Health. Um, it started in Boston, actually, with two MIT students. It was their thesis. Um, and so they basically had an idea to solve an issue in Ghana um, for pregnant women. Um, so a lot of times, pregnant women will find themselves um, in delivery, but no way to go to a hospital. So they'll um, have to have their children on the streets. And obviously this is a major issue, um, and so Moving Health tackles this by creating ambulances that fit on the back of a motorcycle. Um, and so this is actually the first um, model of the ambulance made by the MIT students, and this is now what it looks like. These are the most current ambulances, so it's pretty cool how far they've come. Okay, so what I learned. Um, I learned that I want to work at a safety net hospital. I really liked the values that the hospital had of um, caring for everyone despite their insurance um, and any social background. Um, and also I learned that holistic care contains many different healthcare providers, not just doctors. That was something that stood out to me um, really right away. When I stepped into the clinics, it was not just the doctor that created me, it was the nurses, the patient care navigators, social workers, medical assistants. They all work together and know one role is more important. Well, actually, Dr. Herstack um, prefaced me by saying that it wasn't the doctors that know the patients the best, it's the nurses, because that's who they call when they have just relapsed or they need housing. So it's really the nurses who um, contribute to the lives of the patients at a deeper level. Um, and I also learned the stigma surrounding addiction medicine is extremely prevalent. Um, a lot of people, when they um, when addiction comes into their mind, there's a picture of maybe a homeless person or something like that that pops into their head. And I 
realize that that's just simply not the case at all. Working with each of these patients, if I had seen any of them like outside of the clinic, I would have never guessed that they were dealing with a substance use disorder. Um, and I think this goes for a lot of just addiction in general. I had an aunt who passed away from an overdose a couple of months ago, and you would have never imagined that she was dealing with a substance use disorder. So there's really no one way to think about an addiction. It's different for everyone. Um, and that stigma was really present when um, I was um, when I was shadowing. They that was why I was interested in addiction medicine and Dr. Herstack's presentation because she showed us a video of what addiction actually looks like and I realized my own uh, misconceptions of addiction. Okay, so advice to juniors. Choose something you want to pursue in college. If you do know what you want to pursue in college or anything um, post-college, it's really helpful to get your, to um, start that while you're in high school just because even if you don't like it, it's a big time saver to just try it and say, I know this isn't really for me and then go a different direction. Um, I was really lucky that I really enjoyed shadowing with doctors, but even if I didn't, then um, I could just know that I didn't enjoy it and go on to something else. Um, another is be organized. I am really lucky that um, I started a spreadsheet really early in, in um, the beginning of this. I started by um, working with a doctor from Boston Children's Hospital with um, a research surrounding an abortion policy, and I um, tracked out e every email, every phone call, um, every interaction I had with that. Um, and so I actually wrote my um, college essay about shadowing and that whole process. Um, and it was really nice to look, be able to look back on the details um, of those interactions. Um, and also, you don't need connections to get you started. This was a really big one. Um, it was really hard for me to get my foot into medicine because I don't have any connections, no family members, no friends, nothing. Um, and so it was really difficult to find shadowing, but you don't need connections. All you need is an email address and to be a little bit annoying sometimes. <laughs> um, you can just be relentless with your emails and um, you got really good at emailing. I had Mr. Bloss write pretty much all of my emails in the beginning. Yes, you did. <laughs> and, but it's okay. and then I learned, then I learned. <laughs> you did. It's okay. <laughs> but it's okay. So then I learned how to write emails after Mr. Bloss kind of showed me. And so then I was able to just send out emails to pretty much everyone I could. Um, and you'll be surprised how passionate people can be about their jobs and how willing they are to talk to you about what they're passionate about. Um, and so lastly, do something that challenges you. Um, if I were to look back on all the things that I did, all the mistakes I made, I probably would have never signed up in the beginning. Um, just because like being stuck in a stairway in the hospital in the wrong branch of the hospital and it was terrifying but it really pushed me out of my comfort zone and um, it was really it was a great experience and like Ella she's already on track to doing that and I think everyone should do something that challenges you and do something sign up for something that pushes you out outside of your comfort zone because you can't really get out of it so yeah, that's, those are my tips, and that's all. Thanks, thanks to all seniors who presented in front of assembly. Thanks for all the hard work for everyone at the TED Talks at the Senior Four Point Projects. I'm glad we got to fit in as many as we did over the past few weeks. So thank you. Have a great day. If there's no more announcements. All right. No, yeah.